Today on Straight Talk Africa. Conclusion. For the foregoing reasons, the Chamber sentences Mr. Jean-Pierre Bemba Gombo to a total of 18 years of imprisonment. Former Vice President of the Democratic Republic of Congo, Jean-Pierre Bemba, was sentenced to 18 years in prison by the Hague-based International Criminal Court. Some leaders on the continent say the ICC unfairly targets Africa. But is that really the case? We'll find out right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, July 6th. I am Shaka Sali. Hello, Shaka, and hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Ayan Bior, your social media reporter. Today, we'll talk about African reaction to the sentencing of former DRC Vice President Jean-Pierre Bemba by the International Criminal Court. And coming up later in our STA inbox, we asked, you answered. Audi our audience members have weighed in on our topic through your emails and Facebook comments, and we'll re reveal some of them ahead on Straight Talk Africa. Former Congolese Vice President Jean-Pierre Bemba is behind bars after being convicted and sentenced by the International Criminal Court. But to some, Bemba's sentencing has only reignited the accusations of the court's alleged anti-African bias. My colleague, Paul Sisko, has more. Jean-Pierre Bemba, a former military commander, vice president, Congolese presidential candidate, and now convicted war crimes criminal. Mr. Bemba's failure to take action was deliberately aimed at encouraging the attack directed against the civilian population the International Court sentenced Bemba to a total of 18 years in prison, finding him guilty as charged and responsible for the murder, rape, and pillaging by his Ugandan-supported troops in the Central African Republic in 2002 and 2003. Judge Sylvia Steiner read the unanimous verdict. Murder is a war crime, 16 years of imprisonment. Murder is a crime against humanity, 16 years imprisonment. Rape is a war crime, 18 years of imprisonment. Rape is a crime against humanity, 18 years of imprisonment. And pillaging is a war crime, 16 years of imprisonment. The conviction on the principle of command responsibility is unprecedented for the International Criminal Court. Bemba is also the first person convicted by a global war crimes court for crimes of sexual violence. We aimed to hold accountable those most responsible for the serious crimes, including sexual and gender-based crimes, committed against the civilian population in the country. What this decision affirms is that commanders are responsible for the acts of the forces under their control. They have an obligation to set the necessary standards for their troops and to ensure they do not commit atrocities. Bemba is the first person to be held directly responsible for crimes committed by his soldiers. Bemba's movement for the liberation of Congo Party, the MLC, grew from his rebel army. His supporters say the trial was motivated by his long-standing opposition to Congolese President Joseph Kabila. Bemba lost a close and contested vote for president to Mr. Kabila in 2006. Many African governments have accused the ICC of unfairly targeting its leaders. The ICC denies the bias. The court was created in 2002 as a court of last resort, intervening when national authorities do not, and bringing to trial those responsible for the worst crimes against humanity. Nine of the ten conflicts under investigation by the ICC are in Africa. Cases are referred by the UN Security Council, a ratifying state, or the court itself. More than a quarter of the signatories to the court are African states. In 2014, the African Union granted immunity to sitting heads of state. The court's first verdict in March 2012 was against Thomas Lubanga. The Congolese warlord is now serving 14 years in jail. The Ivory Coast former President Laurent Gbagbo was first brought before the court in 2011. The ICC is still seeking Ugandan rebel leader Joseph Kony. 
and there is an outstanding warrant for Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir. The United States, adding to the accusations of bias, is a permanent member of the UN Security Council. It supports the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction, but it is not a signatory to the Rome Statute establishing it. Paul Sisko, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Uh, but first, for analysis, Bart Kakosa is the chief executive officer of Media Press. He joins us via uh, Skype from the Ugandan capital, Kampala. Good evening, Bart. Good evening, Bart. Bart, are you there? Good evening, Bart. Well, it looks like uh, we... Bart, can you hear me? I see. Well, it looks like uh, we are experiencing uh, some uh, technical difficulties. Uh, um, Gerard Gahima. Thank you. How are you? I'm fine, sir. How are you? I, I am terrific. And uh, I would, of course, uh, formally... Uh, uh, you know, welcome you to the studio. It's a pleasure having you again uh, on Straight Talk Africa after a very, very long time. I'm grateful for the opportunity and the honor to be on your show again. Where have you been lately? Oh, I was in Afghanistan this past year, uh -huh. doing some international development work. You are in Afghanistan. You've been, of course, uh, a judge uh, in uh, uh, judge of war crimes, uh, war crimes court in Bosnia Herzegovina. Yes. You've also been uh, a senior fellow at the United States Institute of Peace. That's right. And before that? Before that, I served uh, in various capacities uh, in the government of Rwanda as uh, deputy chief justice and um, prosecutor general. I see. You are definitely very familiar with uh, this type of cases. And, uh, you know, we go to London, and of course, uh, Professor Reverend Julian Kiyakundia, uh, BRC 2016 presidential candidate, uh, he joins us from uh, London, uh, from the VOA studios. Good evening, uh, Professor. Good evening, Comrade uh, Shakasali. How are you? Terrific like you. I must say that uh, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled uh, to host you, at least for the first time, on Straight Talk Africa. I am very honored today to be a part of your show. And uh, I am a person who is admiring your expertise in doing this work. And today I'm happy that I am in your studio. Well, May God bless you and bless your work. Thank you so much. I have to say the feeling is mutual. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. And U.S. country code is 1. Let me come to you immediately. Of course, we're experiencing some uh, technical difficulties. Otherwise, we should be interacting with Kampala. Um, what was your immediate reaction when you learned about uh, the sentencing of uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba, a man, of course, I'm sure you know reasonably well. Uh, what was my reaction? I, I welcome the decision uh, that someone who is alleged to have been responsible for terrible human rights abuses in a, a fair African state has been brought to account that the victims had the opportunity to bring their grievances before a court of law mm -hmm. and to get the truth about their suffering uh, acknowledged. Uh, but at the same time, uh, like many other people, uh, I have misgivings about the ICC mm -hmm. and the international criminal justice system uh, that we've experienced these past uh, 20 years. I can talk about them at length if you want. I see. What particular misgivings do you have about the ICC? My misgivings, uh, while everyone applauds the efforts that have been made uh, to, er 
to reduce impunity mm -hmm. and to hold perpetrators of atrocities accountable. Uh, the current international criminal justice system uh, is not yet a credible justice mechanism. Uh, for one, the major powers of the world are exempt from this justice. Uh, countries like the US, China, Russia, they are not even parties to the ICC Rome Treaty. Mm -hmm. uh, they retain the freedom to invade other countries and when there is conflict, there are terrible human rights abuses. But they wouldn't let the rest of the world hold them accountable for the conduct of the wars that uh, they wage in other countries. So it's a justice system that targets abuses by the weak, but is nowhere near holding the powerful of this world accountable. Two, even among the weak, the poor countries, it's a justice system that holds uh, people who are out of power, who have lost uh, conflict accountable, but perpetrators who are in power are again immune. One, uh, their patrons, the big powers of the world, try uh, to shield some of these perpetrators of atrocity from justice. For example, you recall that in 2010, there was a UN report, the mapping report, mm -hmm. that talked of terrible atrocities that were committed ag against Rwandan refugees in the Congo in the 1990s. Why would you, don't you find it curious that that report came out and no effort whatsoever has been made mm. to hold the people who are responsible for that violence accountable? The, the, the crimes that Bemba is accused of are nowhere comparable to the atrocities that were committed in Congo in the 1990s. But because the crimes that were committed in Congo in the 1990s were committed by governments uh, that are, have patrons in the big powers, uh, they've not been held accountable. So, and even if charges are brought against perpetrators who are still in power, mm -hmm. they still have the resources to frustrate this kind of justice. They may either decide not to respond to the summons of the court, uh, just defy the court like Bashir has done, or frustrate judicial proceedings as we have done, as we have seen the process work play out with regard to Kenya. How do you get somebody who is in charge of a state, mm -hmm. has all the resources of a, a country like Kenya at, at his fingertips, is in charge of a police force that is responsible for extrajudicial killings of hundreds of people over the past 10 years or so, and you expect witnesses living in Kenya to come forward, talk about his crimes, appear as witnesses against him in a court like the ICC. So this is a, it's not a futile process to have the ICC, but it's a very weak, it's like having a law enforcement system or a court system mm. that is discredited. We need it, we cannot say we should not do without it, but it's nowhere near what we need. It's, it's not a credible process. Well, it was not supposed to be uh a primary court really as such it was supposed to be complementary isn't that correct it was supposed to be complementary uh, to take to hold people accountable whom national systems were unable or, now, or unwilling to bring to justice precisely uh, but then when like the African countries they believe these cases should be brought to an African court R right it will be, if it is ever established, it will be an African court whose judges are appointed by the very people uh, against whom accusations of grave human rights abuses are brought. And probably uh, who would be influenced uh, or, in a sense, uh, compromised. Absolutely. But what about the ICC itself? Can it really put it off uh, 
uh, in a country that is not willing to cooperate with it? I'll give an example. Um, like, with regard to the International Criminal, Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, mm -hmm. uh, the court that tries the Rwanda genocide cases, uh, in practice, it was near impossible for the court to secure the cooperation of state without the support of the United States. So I, I don't see any court uh, being able to get the cooperation of most states without the support of the United States and to some extent the United, the European Union, the major powers of the world. Very interesting, very interesting. Well, now we'll pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website Twitter and we are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka, that's VOA Shaka, and join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA ICC sentence. And we are still on Facebook, just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please, don't go away. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question. Keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther gives you your words, and of course, uh, I have to apologize again to our audience because uh, we did lose uh, Mr. Bart Kakosa earlier uh, in the program, but uh, I'm delighted to inform you that we have him right now. So for analysis, let's go to the Ugandan capital, Kampala, with Bart Kakosa, Chief Executive Officer, Media Plus. Good evening, uh, Bart. Good evening, Shaka. How are you? I'm fine. I'm terrific like you are. I'm glad that you are terrific. In fact, in my particular case, I have to say I am hugely terrific. <laughs> That's great. Now, talk to me, uh, but I know that uh, you were very, very close to Jean-Pierre Bemba. Um, what was your immediate reaction when uh, you learned about his sentencing to 18 years? When you talk about, say, that I was close, I wasn't cl very close, like you say. I was a reporter during the, the, the war, the, 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 the turmoil in, in Congo. So I, I, I spent most of my time reporting his, uh, on, in, on his side of uh, the rebellion. So I knew him as a man who, was, um, who had been actually, well, popped up with, with support from Uganda. And, and the fact that Uganda had... Um, interest in trying to fight the rebels who are in, in Congo, they brought in soldiers from Uganda to who, who actually fought alongside with him. But considering that the, the soldiers from Uganda army were, were general, generally disciplined, so I didn't see any form of indiscipline in the recruits that had been recruited during the, the, the rebellion. So I was actually surprised at the time I heard that Bemba had been, you know, indicted on the grounds of uh, causing uh, mayhem in, in Central Africa Republic. I was really utterly surprised that, that such a thing could happen, that he could have sent people in Central Africa Republic to cause mayhem. Now, you say, of course, that uh, he did have support uh, from Uganda, and uh, there were certain Ugandan uh, soldiers under his command. Do you have a sense as to whether some of those soldiers were also involved in what happened in the Central African Republic? 
At the time when, in 2000, early 2000, the, the, the Ugandan troops were not under the command of Jean-Pierre Bemba. They were under the command of the Ugandan commanders. But for, the, for them, if you are an enemy of my, of my enemy, then you are my friend. So that was the arrangement. But I, they never crossed, Ugandan soldiers never crossed into Central Africa Republic with Jean-Pierre Bemba. And I believe that the, the, the atrocities that, that, that are being alluded to are those that probably could have happened when the Ugandan troops had pulled out of the center of Congo. It is very interesting that uh, we talk about um, Jean-Pierre Bemba being charged for instances, incidences that occurred in uh, the Central African Republic. We don't really talk about uh, his involvement in the Congolese Civil War, for example. Are you surprised by that? I am actually surprised because uh, the circumstances under which Bemba is alleged to have gone into Central Africa Republic are not very, are very kind of smoky. And uh, I, I would have thought that they would have kind of dwelt on or delved into his, his, his activities in, the, in, in Congo. What kind of person, what kind of guy was Jean-Pierre Bemba? Because I know back in 1999, but uh, I met you at the Kampala Sheraton, and I remember that uh, while we were exchanging some social amenities, uh, you were in fact uh, offering to help introduce me to Jean-Pierre Bemba so that we could go to his area of operation. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that very well. You see, one, one of the things that, we, that still remains a fact is that the Ugandan UPDF army is, is, a, is undoubtedly a, a generally very disciplined army. And the fact that they were fighting along with him, not under his command, but, you know, because he, he, they were in his area of control, he really had to have a lot of discipline. So there was no kind of in discipline that I ever saw in, in, in being, you know, done by, by Bemba and his troops. And his troops actually had to very, very vehemently listen to the Ugandan troops who were in Congo at that time. So it is sh surprising that after the Ugandan troops had pulled out, maybe that maybe uh, Bemba became indisciplined. But I would, I find it also far-fetched that with the discipline that had been instilled in him and the fact that he moved into Congo and didn't cause a lot, we moved into government, accepted to take up the position that he had taken. I, I, find, I find it strange that they delved into the matters of him having gone into Central African Republic. I know he was a friend of the president at that time, but I never re remembered him, I never remember him crossing from Badolite to the Central African Republic taking soldiers there. He was a friend, of course, of President uh, Ange Patasi. Is that correct? Yes, he was very close, very close to him. And the fact that his headquarters was, in, when he was fighting the rebels, when he was fighting Kabila then, his headquarters, he was headquartered in a place called uh, Lisala and Badolite. Badolite is close to the, to the Central African Republic border, so he... Well, I used to see him crossing over as a friend, and of course, if you are fighting, whoever wants to give you arms or maybe help, you would actually go. And and because, and of course, if if there was any chaos, if there was any like of being overpowered by the the, the, the government, then I think the exit point would have been the Central African Republic. So he had to be friends with with Patas. Now, but uh, earlier you said that uh, the UPDF, the Ugandan Army, is very disciplined. Um, if that is true, then how do you, yes, how do you uh, reconcile the fact that uh, Uganda is expected to be paying about 10 billion U.S. dollars to the DRC for the havoc that the Ugandan Army caused in the eastern part of the Congo? We're talking about Kisangani and those surrounding areas. I think, I think when you talk about the havoc that was caused by, by the UPDF, it is not correct, because I don't think UPDF caused havoc. There was no havoc that was caused by UPDF. 
There were two armies which were there are the Rwandese army and the Ugandan army. And of course, they had no, they didn't agree on some certain points and they fought. They had some kind of misunderstandings after fighting, they left. But in as far as saying that Ugandan troops, that Uganda army had the policy of going to Congo to loot them, I don't think so. But at the same time, I don't, I don't deny that there could have been some, some problem, maybe soldiers, some, some of the army who could probably have been, been disciplined. If you look at other armies in the world, you look at America, for example, when they went to Iraq, they tortured people. Some, but it was not it wasn't the policy of the American government to torture some civilians or people. So if you say that, I, I don't think it was, it was UPDF. UPDF is still... But isn't, still it, true for, it, is, isn't it true that uh, the International Court of Jurists uh, uh, found the Ugandan, U the Ugandan army or the Ugandan government guilty, and Uganda, in fact, owes the DRC 10 U.S. billion dollars? Yes, that one I'm very, I'm very sure about. But what would have, what would, you see, you, you want to tell me that, that Uganda shouldn't have gone into Congo? There are reasons why Uganda went to Congo. And they went there because they were rebels. And when you are fighting, probably if you are fighting rebels, they, they are people probably get injured, people die. During the war, it's not a picnic. So if they died, but it wasn't a deliberate, I don't think it was a deliberate government policy to go to Congo and cause mayhem. I don't think it was there. And I myself, as a reporter, I never saw the so-called said mayhem that they, that they caused in, this, in Central Africa, in, in DRC. So in this particular case uh, of Jean Pierre Bemba, do you think that uh, the ICC is justified in finding him guilty uh, for committing crimes, you know, uh, for committing crimes uh, against humanity or for committing war crimes uh, in a neighboring Central African Republic? Is he the man that should be taking ultimate responsibility? Or should it be a field commander on the ground or someone that was sponsoring him from a third party country? Well, he, well, when you, when you are the head of, 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 of the an organization, you take responsibility. But at the same time, if I say I think made a mistake, they should have done a lot of due diligence to come on the ground and find out exactly, because I don't think Bemba could have gotten a, a gun and shot anybody himself. There must have been his commanders on the ground. So I think the, the ICC faltered so much in not going on the ground to find out exactly what, what, who those leaders were. In, 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 in Rwanda, for example, they, they, they hunted down whoever was in charge. They didn't say, let's, let's let Abiyarimana let's take responsibility because he was the leader and others should be left to go scotch free. But the, the ICC was wrong. They should have gone and gotten those specific individuals who they claim caused the chaos in, in Central Africa Republic. Well, on that note, uh, thank you very, very much, uh, Bart Kakosa, for your analysis. You are tuned into Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment. But first, here is Ian Bior. Take it away, Ian. Thanks, Shaka. Still to come, we'll reveal some of the fantastic feedback we received from you, our audience, through social media. But now here's our letter of the week from a Straight Talk Africa Facebook fan who responded to our question of the week. Our letter of the week comes from Turumyomwe Fred from Kanugu, Uganda, who writes, having convicted and sentenced Pierre Bemba, the ICC shall now be seen as fair because Bemba had fallen out of favor with the club of African dictators. When someone commits a crime and is proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt, they should be convicted and sentenced accordingly, regardless of the club to which they subscribe. I am patiently waiting for Ugandan President Yawari Museveni to come out and condemn the ICC for having convicted Bemba the same way he did when his clubmates in Kenya were indicted. The ICC should not forget the fact that some African rulers refer to them as a bunch of useless people. Today's youth are not just the next generation of African leaders, they are today's leaders. And this is the time to invest in them, today, not tomorrow.
So let's connect. Let's engage with each other on issues that will transform our societies. Innovation, leadership, entrepreneurship, things that you're doing to move the continent forward to make you the greatest generation that Africa has known. It's up front every Wednesday, 1730 UTC, right here on The Voice of America. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Esther Gidi, you what? And welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. Once again, it's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Ayen. Take it again, Ayen. Thanks again, Shaka. We received tremendous feedback in our STA inbox to this week's question. As we've mentioned, the International Criminal Court has sentenced former Congolese Vice President Jean-Pierre Bemba to prison for leading a campaign of rape and murder in neighboring Central African Republic. This leads us to our question of the week, which asks, what is your reaction to the ICC sentencing Jean-Pierre Bemba to 18 years in prison for war crimes and crimes against humanity? Well, before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for using all our social media platforms to communicate with us. And another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Use the hashtag VOAICC sentence. And if you haven't yet, please follow us at VOA Shaka. And speaking of, let's go to a tweet from Prince Habat Nkula, who tweets, as long as he has been found guilty, then he ought to serve the sentence. We have another tweet from Shagulan Shabi, who tweets, If there's evidence, he has to be jailed. Crimes against humanity shouldn't be tolerated. It's a lesson to other leaders. And we have an, a Facebook uh, comment from our fan Amanua Akubo from Nigeria, who writes, The International Criminal Court sentence against Jean-Pierre Bemba is a very good sign that the court seriously wants to get rid of war criminals and human rights abusers on the continent. It shows that the ICC wants Africa to make meaningful progress. Well, Shaka, these comments have been echoed countless times all over the Internet. Your take. Very interesting. Uh, Professor um, Reverend uh, Julien Kiakundia, are you there? I am there. He's still there. First of, first of all, what was your immediate reaction when you learned of uh, the sentencing of uh, your compatriot, Jean-Pierre Bemba, by the ICC? And what can you say about what you just heard uh, from the reaction via social media? Yes, uh, first of all, I have to say that I was not surprised uh, to see that Jean-Pierre Bemba was sentenced because uh, I knew what was going on. My background of international uh, lobbyist for many years, almost 35 years of my life, I have consecrated on uh, lobbying for current issue on Africa, Congo, and Great Lakes uh, sub-region of Africa, internationally. In 2003, before I left Congo for my uh, uh, voluntary asylum in London, I have told to Jean-Pierre Mbemba in Kinshasa that there is a case pending on him. Even he become president of Congo, he will end by Hague in ICC court. He will be jailed and probably will die there. I have told him in 2003, in July, and he knows that. He knows his chief of security, Samato, was sent by him and his father to me in Kinshasa before I left Kinshasa in August 2003. And this is to say that I am not surprised. But one thing is true, the crimes against humanity 
the crimes of war have been committed in Central Africa. But my question is, Jean-Pierre Mbemba was not a politician in Congo. He was not ever military or chief military. How a man who was a civilian doing his business become suddenly a soldier, chief of army, and uh, have uh, troops, and uh, have uh, weapons to go enter in Congo and start a war. The problem is there. I heard my friend from uh, the journalist, the reporter from uh, Kampala, Kakuza. I have to tell to him that I was a friend of Museveni until we overthrew Mobutu. I contacted Museveni in Oslo, Norway, in 1995. And we did what we could do together with the president of Angola, with the position of the United States, to get rid of Mobutu in 1997. But why today I am not with Museveni? Because I find out that this man is the man who is troubling all the Great Lakes region. It's from where Jean-Pierre Mbemba came, and he was not alone. Museveni created Jean-Pierre Mbemba, created uh, a lot of uh, uh, warlords, sent them to Congo with uh, only one objective, to kill, to rape, to genocide, and to loot the minerals. That's the objective. We'll come Looting back. the minerals. We'll come back to uh, to a bit of that later. Um, Ayen, do you have any more reaction from yeah. social media, please? Yes. In fact, let's go to Kampala, Uganda, where our Facebook fan Asimwe Abel writes: "The period of time that Jean Pierre Bemba had already spent behind ICC bars was enough for the crime he committed." This shows that there is a conspiracy to deny him the chance to contest for DRC presidency in November 2016. And our last Facebook comment comes from Othin Jeremiah, who writes, sentencing Bemba if he committed crime, if he committed the crime is good, but the irrelevancy and balance of ICC on global affairs is evident. The ICC should be disbanded and stopped. It's a weak body that, that has nothing much to do. Well, Shaka, some harsh criticisms here. What's your take? Very interesting. Uh, what about that, uh, Jared? Your reaction? Uh, as I indicated when we started, uh, we applaud efforts being made toward perpetrators of atrocity to justice, but the ICC is a weak institution. Um, it focuses on old crimes committed by the weak mm -hmm. and those who have lost power. It's important as regards uh, atrocities that have been committed by people who are still in office. And I particularly wish to commend the last speaker uh, when he spoke. People like Bemba, uh, they are not the ones who bear ultimate responsibility for the crimes they and their soldiers uh, commit. You, th you think he's a, he's a pawn? I, I, absolutely. I, everyone, like you and me, who is familiar with the history of the Great Lakes region, is fully aware that all these groups of rebels in the Congo were created, uh, armed, trained, and even commanded by the governments the heads of state of countries in the region. For example? For example, Museveni, for example, Kagame. So it's a legitimate question if... What uh, about uh, Jose dos Santos of Angola? And, Mo, and Mugabe. What about Robert Gabriel Mugabe of And uh, the late um, Prime what Minister of Ethiopia. What about Chad? Chad. Um, Burundi? Burkina Faso, all those countries mm -hmm. uh, have been involved in sending, arming, training, commanding rebel groups in other countries. And 
the selective nature of prosecutions by the ICC and the UN tribunals is a matter of concern. Uh, there are institutions that focus on crimes committed by the weak, but they do not address uh, the crimes that have been committed by people who are still in power. What do you think uh, needs to be done in order to make the ICC a more effective institution? The one thing that would be most beneficial, it's unlikely to happen, is if the ICC, rather if we, is if the United States, instead of preaching about human rights, would actually become a member, subject itself to ICC jurisdiction, uh, commit itself to abide by human rights mm -hmm. principles and international law, and then in turn uh, help to promote uh, accountability by other states and governments. And, but that is unlikely to happen. Some will argue, of course, that uh, the Bill Clinton administration mm -hmm. supported that effort. As a matter of fact, uh, it was really pushing for the creation of the Rome Statute. It is simply the Senate that has never been able to... Absolutely not. The, the, the Clinton administration knew that there was no way the U.S. Senate was ever going to ratify that treaty. So it, it, it was a propaganda exercise. Really? Absolutely. Do you have any empirical evidence on that? I mean, the political system in the United States is that you do not subject American soldiers uh, to the jurisdiction of international courts. And this, by and large, is something that is widely believed across the political spectrum. And that's why, as soon as the ICC uh, treaty uh, was signed, uh, the United States government rushed around to force all of us, I was in government at the time, to force us to sign those Article 94 agreements. 98. Article 98 agreements. Your country was the first to sign, as a matter of fact, I think, One if I remember correctly. One of the very first, and it's not like we had Ethiopia, any choice in the Uganda, matter. Uganda, yes. But Kenya didn't sign. South Africa didn't sign. Nigeria didn't sign. Um, those are countries that uh, I can understand why South Africa would not sign. But as I told you, when we started at the beginning, there are governments that are clients of successive United States administration that do what the U.S. wants them to do. Some might call and them puppets and others might call them allies. Regardless of what um, terminology you use, we really did not have any choice in the matter. Neither did many other countries. We'll come to a little bit, uh, a little bit more on that uh, later. Well, thanks, Ayen, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, that does it for today's social media segment. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. And if you are a new fan, drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com. Or post your comment on our Facebook page. Enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel. Sign up to VOA TV to Africa and follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. A reminder that the show is streaming live every Wednesday. Go to VOA Straight Talk Africa TV program page on our website or simply watch us live on your mobile device. Just download the VOA mobile app. Now let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, in the afterglow of America's Independence Day celebrations, Shaka Sali and his guests will discuss what independence has meant and means for Africa. That's next week, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Ayen, and welcome back. And today we are talking about African reaction the sentencing of former Vice President Jean-Pierre Bemba by the International Criminal Court. Our distinguished guests are Dr. Gerard Gahima, former judge of the War Crimes Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina and senior fellow U.S. Institute of Peace. 
and Professor Reverend Julian Kiakundia, Senior, DRC 2016, Presidential Candidate. Well, I have to say, gentlemen, uh, that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you on Straight Talk Africa. Of course, for you, you've been around here, and of course, uh, Julian, for the first time. Okay, thank you. You're most welcome. Thank now, you. Thank you're you. most welcome. Uh, now, Professor, earlier you made what appeared to be very, very serious charges. Among other things, you talked about how you know Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni very, very intimately, that in fact uh, you talked with him and perhaps persuaded him uh, to help remove Mobutu back in 1997. You talked about uh, uh, Jose uh, Dos Santos and others. Do you have any empirical evidence on that? These yes, are very they, serious, they still these are very life. serious they still alive. Uh, they still, uh, uh, President uh, Comrade Dos Santos still alive, and uh, President uh, Museveni still there. But uh, today we are not together with him because I will never enter in a rebellion. I will never be a warlord for Museveni as he is using Congolese and uh, instrumentalizing uh, soldiers from Uganda to go kill, rape from Rwanda. He created Kagame. Together with Kagame, they, they killed a lot of people in the north of Uganda. Then he gave the power to, gave the power to Kagame to go and kill in Rwanda. Together, they created Joseph Kabila, entering the Congo for the purpose of a mineral. And uh, today, you have just mentioned the 10 billion of uh, which Uganda is uh, to pay to Congo. And uh, uh, Museveni is a, the, is a terrorist of the, that sub-region of uh, Great Lakes. It's why our relation broke out. And uh, the evidence is in, uh, in uh, at the State Department. If you want evidence, call it the State Department. They will tell to you what we have been doing to get uh, rid of Mobutu, who became a big dictator in that region. I am against anything going uh, which doesn't respect democracy. I am for the promotion of human rights in that region of Africa. I am for the promotion of good governance and accountability. And I wish that Congo get also international tribunal as for Rwanda and for Sierra Leone. Because the, today, the judgment of the International Court is only for the Central Africa. But in Congo itself, Jean-Pierre Mbemba and his troops, they have done a lot of crimes. And uh, all the rebellions, the warlords like Ruberwa, like James Kabarebe, who was the chief of the army in Congo in 97, as the Congolese, and the year after, in 98, he became chief of the army in Rwanda, and until today is the Minister of Defense of Rwanda as a Rwandese. And then you have to understand how Museveni, Kagame, and Kabila, they are playing games with the life of the people in that sub-region. Very interesting. And this is why uh, Museveni, Kagame, Kabila armed uh, rebellions, created a rebellion since 96 to today. You have many rebellions created in the east part of Congo because of that part of the, the country is the richest uh, part of the, uh, the, 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 the country in the form of uh, minerals. And you have coal town, which is used to, to create to, 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 for, uh, for an international communication, for laptop, iPad, iPhone, all the gadgets we have in the hand today is the blood of the Congolese people. And who are gaining of this? They are Museveni, Kagame, and Kabila. No. They are creating rebellions, arming the people. Well, the weapon is not things you go to, to buy in the market. Now, Professor. Uh, the weapon should come from somewhere. Now, and Professor... Jean-Pierre Mbemba went from civilian to the chief of, uh, of uh, rebellion with the weapon from Museveni and the, and the Kagame. Now, and Prof... there are many of them who are uh, under impunity. Now, Professor. And we, Professor... It's why I encourage. Professor, uh, you earlier Ex characterized. Uh, you earlier characterized. Uh, you're wearing Museveni as a terrorist. 
Uh, you probably would apply the same. He's already a terrorist of the subregion <laughs> of Great Lakes. Yeah, but how? And today how, how do you, I have how do you, to commend. But how do you respond to the fact that uh, Yoweri Museveni is considered to be a bulwark, a bulwark against terrorism in the region? No, he's just playing games because he's our brother, General, uh, General, uh, who is the chief of the army. He's a uh, half brother. You're talking about he General Salim Saleh? Salim Saleh. He is the, the man who is creating rebellions in that sub-region. And with the blessing of Museveni, Salim Saleh is a, is a, is a, is a uh, part Somalian. Let's and he is using Somalian terrorists in that <laughs> sub-region of Great Lakes. I think you have it perfectly wrong, because the last time and I checked, uh, I don't think Salim money. Saleh is uh, a Somali. Uh, let's go to the lifeline of the show, uh, which are the telephone callers. Uh, let's go to Patrick from Nigeria. Good evening, Patrick. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Good evening, Mr. Shaka. Good evening, our guest. Okra for Patrick is my name here in Nigeria, Nigeria. My question to our guest is, why do mm -hmm. ICC allow such a case last so long before judgment? Looking at the magnitude of massacre by the VP, the judgment was, to me, as a, as a Nigerian from Arutuku here, the judgment will serve as a deterrent to African leaders. Although some countries in Africa, the leaders there, still believe in do or die. Why is this so, our guest? Mr. Chaka, Baraka de Salam. Thank you. Let's go to Tefa. Tefa from Ghana. Good evening. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Hello, good evening, Shaka. How are you? I'm great, Shaka. We wish you Eid al Mubarak to you and my sister, Maria Magallo. Same to you, same and to you, all, my brother. And, 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 and all our listeners and viewers across Africa. May Allah continue to bless us all. Same to you. Shaka, Shaka let me also commend the professor. I'm really impressed about the comment by your, your guest, professor. Shaka. The, uh, uh, the Thank community you. Thank of uh, Jumpia Bemba is a welcome. It's a welcome news for me. But sometimes I see that I see Jumpia Bemba as being used as a sacrificial lamb, because as the professor said, these guys were sponsored by some neighbors, the leaders around the the uh, the, the DRT, like a Museveni and, and 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 the other one. They were the ones who were who were, who were sponsoring the the rebellion in, in Congo. So my question is that. What happened to them? Because what happened in Congo, we knew that the, the, the neighbors were the ones who were sponsoring all the atrocities against the civilians there. So what happened to them? I want to appeal to International Criminal Court to cast the net widely, because there are fish, uh, uh, there are big fishes go, moving around in Africa who are also guilty. We need to bring them all to book. We cannot continue to allow people to kill people with impunity. So I'm appealing mm -hmm. to them. It's a time for United States and the EU to come together to look at this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, how do you put them dictators. Thank you. Especially uh, Stephanie, Africa number one terror dictator. He's the one who, 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 who masterminds the massacre in Congo, which we know. That's a fact. So they have to look at these people and bring them to book. Thank you very much, Asa. May God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Tefa. But of course, you know that. Uh, Every human being is innocent until proven guilty. Let's go to Samuel from Uganda. Good evening, Samuel. You're most welcome. Straight Talk Africa. Uh, good evening, Dubushaka. How are you? Usually terrific. What is your question, Sam? I, I go to Dr. Dahima. How come the ICC unites only suspects from Africa? What if in the audience uh, poses the question that, wait a minute, there are atrocities in Iraq, in Syria, in Afghanistan, and even in Europe, and North in America. But none of the suspects in those countries are united by the ICC. So how come does the ICC only unites African suspects and leaves all those people in the, the countries mentioned, uh, uh, you know, not united? But we really conclude that there is some bias on the African continent. Thank you very much, Shaka. What's your take, Dr. Gaima? 
Thank you very much. Very interesting, especially because out of the 10 cases, the last time I checked, only one country is non African, and that is Georgia. Okay. okay. I, I do not really share the view that the ICC singles out Africa. Uh, the problem is that the worst atrocities happen where there are wars. And wars has the majority of conflicts in the world, with the exception of the Middle East. In the Middle East and, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, Israel, those are countries where the major powers are involved. Syria? Uh, again, even Russia. Syria, Russia. So where major powers are involved, uh, like in Palestine, in uh, Iraq, in Syria, in Afghanistan, uh, if you said that people who are responsible for conduct of war that is not in conformity with international law, you would have to hold countries like Russia and the United States accountable. And as I said at the beginning, these countries are above the law in terms of international criminal justice. So the reason that we have the ICC focusing on Africa is that the majority of the big conflicts are in Africa, and where these big conflicts are not in Africa, the big powers are involved, and they are immune to this criminal justice system. And, and in fact, uh, the majority of the cases have actually been referred to the Hague by African governments. That's, that's true. And, um, but what I should say, I think, to one of the callers that we made, the Bemba judgment is, re in my opinion, it's not really a lesson to African leaders. Because uh, to date, African leaders are immune because mm -hmm. they receive protection from major powers. Mm -hmm. The Bemba judgment is, if anything, just a lesson to rebels and people who have lost power. Who have lost power. Yes. W what about uh, the Chilcot report, the Iraq inquiry report, which seems, frankly, con to contain damning verdict on Tony Blair, the former British Prime Minister for British involvement in Iraq. If international criminal justice was a fair criminal justice system before which all governments and all politicians were capable of being held accountable, mm. you could, in theory, see Blair being held accountable by an international court. But that's unlikely to happen. But why should that be when, in fact, the British courts themselves can do the job? Because the ICC is complementary. The, the British court, uh, the, 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 the UK, is um, a member. You have 20 seconds of, of, of the ICC. Yes, the ICC. The, remember what you said, that the courts, the ICC is complementary. It tries people who in domestic courts are unwilling or unable right. to act. Right. There's no way the UK is ever going to say that it's not able to try Blair. The parents, of, uh, the parents who lost some of their sons in the war say, in fact, they are going to sue Blair. They might well do. Well, that's something we can only wait and see the outcome of. Well, on that note, thanks to our distinguished guests, Dr. Gerard Gahima, former judge of the War Crimes Court of Bosnia Herzegovina and senior fellow of the U.S. Institute of Peace, and Professor Reverend Julian Kiakudia, senior DRC 2016 presidential candidate, who joined us from VOA London Studios. Thanks to our affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, Learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not beta Africa. And please remember to keep the African hope alive.